It's not a secret when I started my automation agency, I made mistake after mistake. From not having clear scopes on projects to not even remembering my client's name, I've made a fair share. So this video is going to be a step-by-step -step guide on how you can set yourself up for success when it comes to service delivery. First and foremost, get an account on flyflies.ai and get AI to start taking notes on your sales calls. When I first started my agency, I would forget so many key details that I would speak to people about in meetings. What that led to was me having to follow up with the lead consistently asking them repetitive or small questions and it made me kind of just look a little bit unprofessional. With Fireflies, you can invite it to your meeting and it starts taking notes and will transcribe back to you everything that was spoken about in that meeting after the call. This has been a literal game changer for me and my clients because I no longer have to worry about taking physical notes and I can just have it sent back to me at the end of the call. So that's number one. Number two is have a solid onboarding process. When I worked at Apple, there was a massive emphasis on the client experience in store to the point where there was a specific guide on how to polish the Apple logo after you had repaired a Mac. They understand very well how important it is to look after your customers after they've purchased from you. An example of really bad onboarding comes from an OG SaaS company, Dropbox. Dropbox experienced serious competition in their early days, especially people were just getting used to storing content on the cloud. The initial hurdles that Dropbox was facing was although their technology was technically superior and was great for tech savvy individuals, many users didn't fully grasp the value or how it integrated with their workflow. Realizing this, Droppy B simplified their onboarding experience and laid out a step-by-step -step process that each user can follow when they signed up for an account. This included a clear and concise welcome email, an interactive guide that took people through uploading their first file and sharing their first file, and also installing the Dropbox client on their machine. They also implemented implemented a nifty little gamification of the product as well. So the more stages that you would do in the tutorial, you would actually unlock free storage space on Dropbox, which is a pretty good way to get people to actually go through the tutorial process. It led Dropbox users to becoming more interactive with the software, leading to longer term usage and more of those aha moments happening earlier on, which sparked more word of mouth referrals and increased usage. A really solid onboarding process ensures customers start winning with your product or service as soon as possible. And that's why it matters to be a customer focused business. For me, I want to reduce customer friction as much as possible. And a proper onboarding helps my customers not feel lost when they've actually signed up. I want to take people on a journey. I want them to, I want to walk them from A to B. And that will increase the amount of time that they stay with me, tell their friends and want to do business with me again. A really good customer onboarding experience takes people from what does this product do to I can see how this is really beneficial for me. So when I take on a new client, I ensure that they're never in the dark from the original sales call to their onboarding call to the fulfillment of their product. So when someone signs up, I'll talk through what the next steps are, what the type form is they need to fill out and get them scheduled for their onboarding call straight away. From here, my automations will send out the email, they'll send out the contract, they'll send out the meeting links for them to book in and we'll follow up with them if they haven't completed the steps along the way. Number three is delivery time and standard. I don't care if you sell automation for a plumber, if you sell chatbots, if you sell AI integration for businesses, I don't care what the service is. Your word is bond when it comes to working with clients. And there's one thing that that I've always said that I wanted to be good at and that is delivering on what I say I'm going to do. Back to Apple for a second, we were taught to always under promise and over deliver. So if something was gonna take two hours, quote three so that you had wiggle room just in case, but also giving you the chance to call the customer early and surprise and delight them with an earlier turnaround time. Someone else who is also well known for this is Elon Musk. Elon is known for setting hyper aggressive targets to the point where Tesla has been criticized for some of the production promises they've made and that have struggled to meet in the past. Tesla had targets of producing 5,000 Model 3s by the end of 2017. However, the company struggled and they weren't actually able to meet that until mid 2018. However, Musk is known for his unrelenting work Work ethic, but despite setback after setback, Daddy Elon would sleep at the factory to ensure that production targets could be met. Now his deadlines were created by him, but it drove urgency in the whole company. And while sometimes seen as a little bit too aggressive to commit to, Musk's principles emphasize the idea of pushing boundaries, but also needing to be really clear on the time frame that you can commit to. Being clear and concise about targets can create a sense of urgency when it comes to your team and can lead to more satisfied clients, even if there is the occasional hiccup along the way. The key is in that commitment 
and the commitment to deliver on the target. Therefore, when it comes to my projects, for example, if something's gonna take me two weeks, I'm gonna quote three. That way, if something happens in my time frame, uh, if I get sick or whatever, I still have a week buffer to deliver on that promise. And something I realized about myself is I work really well on externally imposed deadlines. So if I commit to something to someone else, it's really going to help me achieve that target because I don't want to let them down as well. I kind of realized this when I was at university, when I was only really accountable to myself because my teachers did not give a crap about me. If I was honoring my own deadlines, I knew that I would leave it to the last minute and I wouldn't do as good a work. However, if I was working in a team and we committed that we would submit the assignment early or something along those lines, I would be honoring them more than I would be honoring myself. So being aware of that, I always try and communicate with my clients that I want to set a deadline that is going to be a little bit aggressive, but will ensure that I will work hard to get it. Step number four is have a damn contract. But you can probably call in an agreement. If Emily, my girlfriend ever watches this video, she will say, I told you so about three times before I even finished this sentence. When it first came to working with clients, I didn't want to have a contract. And it comes from my inherent nature of wanting to see the best in people, but also not wanting to have that awkward conversation about here is a terms and conditions that we have agreed on so that you don't screw me over and just ghost and not pay. When I thought I would introduce a contract, I thought people would all of a sudden become really hostile and create friction in the buying process. Now that was a personal thing that I was projecting onto the situation because contracts to me in the past, I have not liked signing. But if we look at the evidence here, the clients that I have contracts with, I have produced the best outcome, period. Now I think that is because the client and I both have an agreement on what is exactly going to be produced by me. And every client I don't have a contract with, I always, always experience scope creep. Now, if you don't know what that is, let me share a bit of an experience of something from my home country, the Sydney Opera House. The Opera House was put forward to be built in the 50s and it was meant to be a pretty straightforward project and it was estimated to cost about 7 million Australian dollars. And it was meant to be finished by 1963. As construction began, a bunch of things started to happen which started to expand the project beyond its original scope. The designer who actually designed the Opera House, the actual roof, the technology to build that hadn't been created yet. So they hadn't actually factored in how difficult it was going to be to construct the technology to actually make the roof. And the materials and the techniques that were actually used in building the opera house, they didn't exist yet, which led to a bunch of trial and error. Not to mention the beef between management and political figures at the time. The original designer ended up leaving and a new team of architects came along and took over the project. Now everyone else had to be brought up to speed and there was a lot of coaching going on, which expanded the time even further. Now the opera house was eventually finished in 1973, a full decade after the estimated completion date. And the original cost of 7 million ended up being 102 million. That's a bit more than expected. This example of the Opera House reflects against projects that are new to you. So if you haven't done something before, be extra careful of the creep that can come about when you are learning new technologies on the go. And especially if you're starting out in business, you don't probably understand what is actually required for you to fulfill on the promises that you make. Especially if you're going through the sell first, build second model, which I often did, you will come across hurdles that you didn't even know existed and they will hit you in the face and every single day. Now, the reason I call it an agreement is because I like to see it as more of a meeting of mine rather than a contractual obligation. And it's like you and I are agreeing on this is the work that's gonna be done. And if it doesn't get done in a certain amount of time or whatever, then we have steps to rectify it. In my opinion, service delivery isn't so much about how good your product is. It's more about how well does someone adapt your product into their life or to their workflow and how long do they continue to want to use it? The more I focus on this kind of stuff, the better results my clients get. And the more that those clients then want to go tell their friends, which leads to more word of mouth referrals for me. And I think that's super important for a business is to have a good reputation and say what they're going to do. I hope you found this valuable. Uh, the end. Bye.